I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, joined today across the table with marketing director and familiar voice on the show, Neil Davies. Neil, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Absolutely. And this guest that we have with us today, I know one of your personal friends and somebody that's been instrumental in shooting as a whole, but in, and in fact, a lot of our cartridges that we've come to release as Sammy Adopted Cartridge. Yeah, that's right. George has been around for a minute or two and you know, kind of set himself apart as a as one of the premier gun builders and gun manufacturers out there in the industry. Yeah, it's just fantastic. And a guy that knows a thing or two about a thing or two. Yeah. And we're happy to have him on the show with us, George. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, it's good. Great to be with you guys. Look forward to talking with you about a number of things today. Yeah, we've got a lot to cover. And <laughs> yeah. before we get into the, the meat and potatoes of it, I like to give our listeners a little bit of insight of of who the guest is and in your case george gardner where are you from what were you growing up doing were you hunting and shooting were you an athlete in high school and and what'd you do uh as you grew up yeah a little of everything uh i was actually a swimmer as my athletic foray in high school and did a little soccer as well um i started shooting with my grandpa probably when i was around eight to ten mainly dove and rabbit hunting uh bakersfield california there's lots of of uh, mills around there with grain so kind of grew up just shooting doves and rabbits around grain mills um, joined the military right at 17 years of age out of high school uh, competed in high power rifle through my army days and got out of the military in the fort leavenworth kansas area and competed in high power rifle across the course right here in kansas and missouri uh, got on with the local sheriff's department, spent a couple of years with Platte County Sheriff's Department, which uh, is kind of north side of Kansas City. Uh, then I did get on finally with the city police department in North Kansas City. Uh, shot high power through my career as a police officer. I guess the turning point was really when I got on the SWAT team with the police department. Uh, kind of really got into the whole, you know, marksmanship sniper role. Um, Really wanted to start building my own rifles for high power and competing. So got with uh, Marty Bortson. Everyone probably knows him from Badger Ordnance. He just moved to the area. Um, He worked at Dakota Arms as one of their gunsmiths and engineers. So I picked his brain for a course of four or five years and uh, spent a lot of time building guns and, and watching him build parts. Actually doing shot shows for Badger. Uh, for four or five years with him just kind of learning the industry that was my little step in back in you know 95 through 98 ish Um, started ga precision kind of as a hobby job really my wife wanted to go back to school uh, needed to make a little bit more money nothing crazy but enough to to get her through school uh, along with my police paycheck so i started building a few guns for local guys uh, that spurred on to some police departments Kind of the funny thing, there wasn't really an internet or Facebook or even forums back then. There was just these email yeah. blockchains where, you know, it was 500 officers in an email group and you'd share ideas. And uh, I got on one called Rec uh, LE Guns or something like that. And I uh, got to know a lot of the TAC commanders and sniper types from the United States. And we started building quite a few sniper rifles for police departments. So... That's kind of how I got into it. It kind of morphed in what it is now through the years of uh, different competitions popping up. Some of the earliest ones, I guess I can remember, um, were matches in Wyoming that a guy named Dave Lout used to put on. Um, yeah. Up and in, then, where was that? Oh, in Gillette? Yeah, it was up in Gillette. And then yeah. uh, Jacob Bynum at Rifles Only was putting on 24-hour matches and then started putting on some of the Sniper's Hide matches at his place. Um, those were probably early 97, 90 through 98, 99. And then uh, Bobby Whittington at Badlands Training Center was putting on a sniper quest match back then as well. So really, if you were into competing this in what's now, I guess, called the PRS or NRL type matches, uh, back then they were there was three of them nationwide and maybe there was 30 to 40 people that shot those matches. 
Yeah, and small grown, pool compared yeah, to today. It's grown into literally probably 20 to 30 matches on any given weekend, one day regional type matches. And oh, I'd say between all the different actions that are out there now, you're looking at 72 day national level matches, probably nationwide with three or four different finales. So it's really gotten crazy. So. Yeah, the the match scene specifically has grown exponentially, and it's kind of it's trended well with the the availability of accurate laser rangefinders, accurate factory ammunition, and accurate rifles and quality optics. As all of those different components have continued to increase in their reliability and their effectiveness, the level of competition has just skyrocketed. Yeah, and ballistic calculators. That's another oh, one. Yeah. You know, uh, instead of just having to shoot and then proof out your your dope, you know, you could actually now just get it on the fly. Yeah, real time. And and it was, yeah, real time and much more accurate than writing everything down and all your different weather conditions and such. Yeah, and I, so George, George, George and I are, are pretty good friends. We spend a lot of time together. And so I know a lot of the, 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 the backstory and some of the fun stuff that, you know, is worth is worth chatting about. But um, George is, was a canine handler in the Army. Um, and then that, transitioned into the law enforcement side so Ooh. he's he's had canine dogs and still to this day has has malinois and shepherds and lots of dogs but that's that's been a big part of your life i suppose huh george close to being right i wasn't a canine handler in the military i was actually a military police investigator i did work with the oh canines. yeah i Sorry. did work i did work with the canines quite a bit but became a full-time canine handler at north kansas city police department from 2007 to 2000 or 2017 so i'm sorry that's not right 97 to t- to 2007 got that off by 10 years. okay a decade kansas city being a, a pretty big metro area and being a canine handler that that had to be on occasion a pretty eventful yeah, <laughs> line of work <laughs> yeah i mean north kansas city is its own department and it's just the area kind of north of downtown so my shop is still in North Kansas City and kind of backs up to the big sky scene, you know, downtown. But we were uh, uh, compact with Kansas City, uh, Shawnee, Kansas, Overland Park, Independence. So all those dog handlers actually trained together on Wednesdays and we made calls mm-hmm. for each other. So even though I wasn't a Kansas City, Missouri officer, I would make, you know, narcotics sniffs for them. Uh, big, you know, school searches, which was we used to do back in the day, just search every locker in the school for dime bags and such. Uh, we would get together and do that. But, uh, yeah, it was fun kind of working with those guys, you know, got called down on several, several occasions when their dogs were busy, you know, doing something to, to work cases for them. So, uh, it was fun. I, I do miss the whole canine aspect. I don't know that I would want to be an law enforcement officer in these days, but I, I do, sure. miss, I do miss what I did back in the day. Yeah. And you probably had some interagency stuff too, State Patrol maybe and things oh, yeah. like that too. Yeah. I was yeah. just telling you the other day about uh, one specific State Patrol guy I used to, to yeah. hang around with and run narcotics on the highway with. And he's the ballistic, the director of the ballistic research facility for the FBI now. So it's like kind of a small yeah. world. Yeah, it is a bit of a small, small world. <laughs> and it always is. And the industry is even smaller, you know, when you're in, you know, you're kind of a fishbowl. Uh, yeah, you see the same names, but they end up, you know going all over the place and and it is a small industry it is, but you know speaks but then george you know you you obviously have uh you know kind of a diverse clientele but with that comes some some notoriety and some some of the famous folks that reach out to you from time to time and want to get some of your guns mm-hmm. i mean one one particular person that got a lot of notoriety was chris kyle obviously yeah chris uh when he got out of the military uh formed craft international it was a training uh facility uh, in Texas. And they did, uh, basically guys that were interested in training with a, a Navy SEAL sniper would go sign up with Chris and he'd teach them, you know, what they wanted to learn. I think every class is a little bit unique from what I understood. But, uh, one of the things they got into is, uh, building a rifle like Chris and a Chris specked out a rifle kind of on his own. It actually ended up being a rifle that, uh, that Frank Galley from Sniper Hide had actually kind of had built earlier kind of probably two or three years earlier and chris really liked that rifle so he uh he purchased one for himself and then some of his clients wanted them and he, those guys were buying the rifles and, and you'd train with chris with that rifle and then you would buy it as part of the training 
So we did mm-hmm. quite a bit of business with, with those guys. You know, Which the, model was that? Yeah, was that a yeah. Templar back in the day or something? It's, it's, it's actually the Gladius. It's, it's, it's still on our website. Still, still a very top selling gun on our, our website. It's a short barreled 308 with a 10 twist on it. Uh, very handy, you know, very suited to, to, uh, urban type sniping um which if you read a lot about chris there's stories about the long shots he took but 90 percent of what he did was house to house you know type shooting and that that was mm-hmm. kind of why he liked that gun it was short handy lightweight and you know still on the in the 308 caliber that all the snipers still use to this day so yeah and that's kind of a another point so i don't know you and i met I don't know when it was, 07, something like that, 08 maybe. I don't remember. But we were at the Texas Tactical Rifle Hunt, which is kind of a collective of a bunch of people in the industry that kind of deal with that segment, you know. Um, But yeah, George, I mean, you and and those like you were kind of counterculture then because after the Brady Bill sunsetted, everybody and their brother was doing ARs and there wasn't a whole tremendous amount of folks that were focusing on bolt guns, you know. Yeah, precision bolt guns. Yeah, when I... When I got into it, and I, I apologize if I missed somebody, but um, I think Texas Brigade Armory, Iron Brigade Armory, which was Norm Chandler, a former uh, Marine Corps colonel, uh, Terry Cross from KMW Long Range Solutions, Mike Resignio from TAC Ops. Uh, those are pretty much the only guys doing what what I do now. And uh, t- Terry's still in business. Mike Resignio is still in business. So I don't, I'm not sure about the other two, but there's probably a thousand guys doing it now. So it went, yeah, from, a lot of folks, do you it. know, five companies that were pretty well known for doing this type of thing to, to, uh, I mean, I'm just guessing there's, I know there's numerous hundreds, but probably close to a thousand different gunsmiths building these types of firearms. I think the one thing that we still have a niche of is we build all the Marine Corps M40, A1, A3, A5s, and A6s. And there's really no one that replicates those like us. So that's the one niche thing that that we still do especially that i have two 2112 armors still working for me one of them was actually the shop chief for a long time so yeah. it's kind of like having a little 2112 shop here i mean yeah that's kind of a neat little thing to hang your hat on too though yeah. not everybody gets to build marine corps sniper rifles yeah, that's yeah cool. we've actually built them for other countries that wanted the, what the marine corps has and you can't just go buy that rifle because the marine corps builds it themselves so mm-hmm. we've outfitted you know favorable nations entire sniper units with the uh, with rifles of the you know the marine corps build spec so that's it's been that's pretty remarkable yeah, it's been pretty neat some of them were even through our department of defense that purchased the guns for those nations so we've, mm, we've wow. had some doing some stuff like that yep and that's got to feel good at you know to start a company uh years ago just trying to make some extra money to help your <laughs> wife you know go back to school to now having worldwide notoriety for building extremely accurate reliable precision rifles yeah it's it the more i think about it, of course my wife likes to always tell everyone it was her fault that i got into this but it, <laughs> i do actually kind of got to give her some credit because it would have never happened if she had just stuck it she had she had an actual really good job and she just kept making the point that i was doing what i wanted to do and she, it was her turn to go to school and do what she yeah. wanted to do so she she got her uh, BA in nursing and became a, a RN, and she's worked with with children in uh, hospitals ever since. So, and you guys awesome. met, and you guys met in the army. Did you meet in Germany or somewhere else? No, in Germany, she was a. We were both in First Armor Division. She was a signal specialist, and uh, our uh, what they called concerns, but like our uh, barracks were like right down the road from each other. And I think we actually met us at a. At a city fest like in germany those are just big festivals oh, yeah. that goes downtown to yeah. drink this happened to be the spring festival in Ansbach, germany and just met on the street by fate kind of wasn't yeah. like a set up date or i didn't see her at you know in uniform i actually thought she was a german gal when i met her but it turns out she was an adult <laughs> girl. that's interesting <laughs> that is yeah. then and that obviously worked out uh for everyone yeah uh, not just yeah, worked out for you, worked out for her, worked out for the shooting industry as a whole. Yeah, yeah, and sure. I mean, Shannon travels to uh, you know she'll go to matches and she'll RO and she's a big part of that as well. Yeah. When she's not antiquing, right? Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. She's, she thinks she's uh, the next best thing to uh, American picker. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, she she loves to antique. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so right now, from a timeline standpoint, you get everything created and and you're really making a name for yourself as far as the rifles and building rifles are concerned. Um, on the competition side, you know, uh, I've said this before in podcasts. I came into the industry at about 2013 and immediately started. Uh, shooting matches, but there wasn't a ton available at that time, and and it hasn't it wasn't quite standardized. We were still doing a lot of precision rifle with a pistol. Um, you know, you, you know, you'd have equal number of pistol shots to rifle shots, that kind of thing, and that was around 2013. So prior to that, though, the PRS was forming or formed, and and it really started to escalate. So from a timeline standpoint, where did you really start getting involved into the competition side of things? So, like I said, those really early matches just really interested me. Um, I wasn't really building guns yet back then. I was just, you know, kind of a enthusiast with shooting high power. So my very first gun for doing this was a Remington 700 Varmint Synthetic that, you know, I read a book on glass bedding and, you know, bought some stuff from Brownells and, you know, did some home gunsmithing on and put an old Leupold Barry X3 with turrets on it like some kind of target turrets and i just go to a farmer's field and, and shoot mr high power targets just kept moving them out another 50 yards and 50 yards and writing the dope down and would show up to these matches in texas and uh just pull out a standard dope book and shoot data that i gathered in missouri and for the most part it'd work out because the climates and the, the elevations were similar um i'm pretty sure most people did it like that back then i kind of remember when the first horace kestrel came out and you could grab data, you know, with a BC and, st- and such like that. And it made things a little bit easier, but they fine tuned that obviously a lot more like with ballistics calculators, like forward off and others that, that really, you know, inch in on the curves and stuff. But yeah, back in the day, it was just writing it down on a piece of paper and carrying a book with you. And, and for the most part, it worked pretty dang good. It just wouldn't do you much good if you changed elevation or if the weather changed significantly. Yeah. yeah. You have to get another data book. Yeah. But as far as, as the competition thing and how it grew and my part in it, um, uh, there was some talk between so like Texas, Oklahoma guys have always been big in this. It, it, you know, historically a lot of those guys are just shooters and, and I think it's cause they have a lot of flat land and long, you know, they can shoot long and it's just, you know, the kind of the whole South, you know, I don't know. They just those guys have always been involved in it, so it kind of all started down there. But the guys that were really into the competing kind of wanted a place to keep score, you know, for the year. So, like I said, there was only three or four matches. The whole idea was, you know, the scores would be kept throughout the year, and you kind of crown a winner based on how many matches they shot and how many you know points they got at each one of these matches. And it just really had to do with the percentage of your score from the winner. And that was mm-hmm. all talked about on Cypress Side. It was like Rich Emmons. Vu Fam, Scott Milkovich, Wade Studeville, um, just all started talking about it in the open forum on Sniper Side about, hey, how could you keep score? What would be fair? You know, there wasn't even a name for it. PRS wasn't even mentioned as far as that in those talks. You know, Frank's membership got involved in it a little bit. You know, Frank could chime in quite a bit about it. And then I think in 11, maybe, uh, he formed a board, which they asked me to be on. Uh, and then those names I just mentioned, they were all board members. And we kind of started coming up with the first set of little rules that would kind of intertwine the whole thing. Because you had, you know, four matches at four different places. You know, those matches were all run a little bit differently. And how, you know, how could we put points to paper and, and you know, crown a season champion type of thing. Um, lots of learning curve. You know, I'm not saying we made all the right decisions. Lots of people helped along the way as far as how it ended up actually being but as what i learned mostly is even if there was disagreements on stuff the more longevity it had the more people got used to it the more it just worked you know if you could get mm-hmm. over the first couple years or of griping and you know bend the rules a little bit to where everyone can get along it, it, it's smooth sailing and then we actually ended up purchasing and when i say purchasing a group of guys that were all board members except for a couple uh purchased the series from rich um at the time i don't even know if we knew we were purchasing anything a small website yeah. and just <laughs> a whole lot of grief but um 
we got Rich some money to take care of some things he, Rich needed to do and uh, hired Sean, who was also a, an owner, to, to run the thing. And, you know, Sean had just came out of the military as a very high operator in the military and I don't think was used to talking as much to to individuals. And he had some learning to do. And, of course, we all did. Uh, anyway, at the end, like – we got a set of rules out there. We used, you know, lots of guys in the industry to talk to, you know, Mike Voigt came on the board just to pick his brain on, you know, being the president of USPSA for so long and what type of learning curve they went through and what, what was ahead of us. And, and yeah. And I mean, Mike had won, I think it was Mike and Benny Cooley maybe were together, but they won like the U S world, uh, sniper match. I mean, so yeah. he, he's been, he, he, he'd he, been around, you know, uh, Bless his heart. I mean, you know, rest in peace because he was he was a great guy and he he left us all way too early. Oh, but yeah, for sure. he had a he 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 left uh, a legacy that transcended. I mean, all shooting sports. I mean, he was he he was interested in everything. But you're right. I mean, why wouldn't a guy that knows all? I mean, I was gonna say like the two lasting couple shooting and uh, uh, genres that are really lasted the test of time so far have been USPSA. Obviously, Ipsic is the international version of that and then you know prs is coming on strong yeah you know, there's unfortunately not one really for three gun i mean it falls under uspsa to some degree but there's not an independent body there you know right mm. and then i've never really gotten into three gun i remember when uspsa was doing some two gun stuff where you'd shoot a carbine in your yeah. pistol and you know they added the shotgun and i've never really gotten into it since they did that but like it's it's a lot of fun. It's just if you imagine PRS is just a spinoff of the rifle part of that with longer engagements and maybe not as much running. And yeah, yeah. You know, it's it is different at every match. The match directors still have uh, the authority over their match to do what they want. They just have to f- fall in scoring wise and, and safety wise into a, a, a fairly. I want to call it generic, but a fairly agreed upon set of rules for uh, keeping continuity from match to match. And, and PRS is, you know, it's quick. You don't have to reset anything. You're just, you know, oh, yeah, you're banging steel. steel and, you know, whereas a USPSA match or three gun and whatnot, you're resetting, you're pasting, pasting your targets. Yep. And now, George, are you still on the PRS board? Um, yes. And the board's a little bit different. Yeah. Um, so just really quickly, we, we ended up selling the, uh, and mainly it wasn't because we wanted to it's just uh, at the time myself wade and some of the other guys had you know companies to run and it took way more time than we ever estimated you know it would uh running the thing so uh a guy came in with and he had some uh interest in really growing the web aspect of it i think because the guy was in the software web business and he really wanted to grow the the maybe the marketing and the web version of it maybe apply a little bit of media tv to it um he found out instantly and i warned him he found out instantly that it was just a lot of work it's not what everyone thinks it is it's a ton of work you know uh, it's very easy to to be a shooter and not understand how much how much time and effort goes into to to a series and being in charge of it and you know basically helping all the match directors helping all the shooters uh, you know there's trophies there's there's magnet the magnitude of how much support goes in from the prs is like i think unnoticed by most and it's very hard to convey it to people unless they step into the shoes and actually do it um but at any rate, this this gentleman had it for a couple of years and called me and said, you know, um, you were the guy who basically told me it was a lot of work and I'd, I'd like to give it back to you, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm Thanks like, well, back. I'm not interested, um, even though he was gracious and was going to give it back for pretty much nothing. I, I, I realized that it was beyond the amount of time I had to put into it. Um, but I did know that Shannon Kay, who ran it for us shortly at the end of our tenure, was getting out of the military. He had already started a, a shooting facility in Tennessee. And t- for me, it was like it went with his business. You know, he's a competitor. He's got a nice competition facility. He's getting out of the military where he was an officer and directed traffic, you know, as in the military. If anyone could do it, it was him. He never really got a chance to do it for a full year under us. So. 
I told the guy to call Shannon. I quickly called Shannon and told him a phone call was quickly coming. And I hear it all the time from him when he gets, uh, gets hit from all sides and gets a little stressed out that it's all my fault. But at the end of the day, he's done a great job. And to the guys who have peeve with Shannon, just realize nobody can even imagine how much work goes into it. Like it, that's the one thing I would love to convey to shooters is take it easy on Shannon and the PRS sometimes if you don't understand what's going on because it's the magnitude of how much work goes into that is it cannot be comprehended unless you do it. Yeah, and we can't and we can't forget the the other half to that mix is is Julie who does yeah. a lot of the administrative stuff. Yeah, I'd actually, she's I'm, Johnny on the I'm spot. Glad you bailed me out there, Neil, because Julie does yeah. ninety percent of it. Shannon, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's be honest. I mean, Shannon, Shannon's a big part of decision making, but boy, Julie, Julie is uh, she executes a lot, and she's fantastic. But so, but but back to being a board member, the board has changed now. The board is, in fact, all the match directors. Shannon's basically made every match director a quasi board member. So there's a, a secret page on Facebook where every match director's on there. Shannon will put a vote up before all of us on everything. So if, if a member gives an idea for a rule change, for instance, it comes before the board, we all discuss it first, maybe some little changes are made to make it actually work. And then we vote on it. If it votes in the uh, Shannon's job to put it in the rule book and, and implement it. If it votes out, then they explain to the person who submitted it that, hey, this is why it was voted out. The, the, the board and or the match directors felt this was, uh, you know, not needed or or would cause undue stress on shooters or, or the matches. or whatever. And maybe that's something that a lot of people don't understand, that that, that process is actually quite diplomatic. Yeah. It's not a... Yeah. Yeah. It's not a kingdom, and Shannon doesn't make those decisions arbitrarily. Here's the funny thing: Shannon doesn't even vote on it. Shannon would be the Shannon would probably be the tie-breaking voter if it ever came to that. But uh, we haven't even had any close votes. They've all, they've been probably seventy to eighty percent one way on every vote we've had, and Shannon has not had to vote. But Shannon, I've heard people call Shannon a dictator. It makes me laugh because he doesn't even vote in that. He he brings it before yeah. us, and we all vote. So. Well, and it, yeah, it's probably easy to to cast judgment when you don't see how much work, yes, and how much stress, and then you're working under a microscope because there's, I don't know, probably a couple thousand registered PRS shooters. Well, there's tens of thousands of people who compete in precision rifle stuff or at least shoot recreationally that follow the PRS mm -hmm. uh, that still have an opinion but don't get to see any of the the behind the scenes work that goes into it. Yeah, yeah, I think there's actually twenty twenty nine hundred or so. Pro Series members, and there's close to there's over ten thousand now. Because I've seen recently some, I've seen some recent recent regional membership numbers when they register for my matches, and it's it's getting really up there. It's actually it's crazy. You know, I'm I'm number seventy. I actually wasn't one of the first members because I didn't even know they were doing member. They were actually doing memberships at the time they started it, but. Like Rich is number one. You were just yeah. you were just grandfathered in, or like, what? no? I mean, I, just, I, I literally wasn't paying attention that they were actually doing memberships at the time, so I wasn't one of the first weeks worth. I was probably a couple months into it, but like Jeff Badley, I know is number seven. Wade's got to be like number three or four or something. Yeah, Wade. Wade was probably early, early on. Yeah, and there's a couple of guys. I mean, yeah, you're right, Wade. Yeah, I mean, Wade's been instrumental in in what's taking place. Um, but you know. The the guys that are still around from day one is Wade, myself, Jeff Badley. Um, you know, Rich, em Rich Emmons comes around every once in a while. He hasn't shot a match, but they uh, honored him with the Lifetime Achievement Award a couple of years yeah. ago. So he came and gave a speech. And it was interesting talking to Rich from his perspective as being kind of the founding member of it. Um, but yeah, it's going strong. Uh, I think Shannon's a little not as stressed out because everything's running pretty smooth. A lot of match directors want to get in. We'll see how they tackle that. Um, I know there's going to be a vote here shortly on making the season end a little bit sooner to let people have a little bit more flexibility for hunting, which has always been a big thing for me. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Guys that don't hunt can shoot matches, you know, in September, October, and November, but those of us that like to hunt really don't want to be thinking about that. So, and there's a lot of them. I've talked to them. So I, I, I know there's going to be a vote on that. I, I don't know when that'll, that'll happen, but. Yeah, yeah and I mean, the, the, the cool thing about one. PRS, though, is, you know, as it's gained prominence, I, you know, I think it's, it's had a big impact on the industry. Um, there's a lot of folks that 
quote unquote shoot PRS type stuff, they maybe never compete in a match, but everybody wants to have a precision rifle of some form or another, which then lends itself to buying advanced bullets, getting into reloading, uh, optics, you know, trajectory calculators. Yeah. yeah, everything starts to benefit from that. So the 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 the, the ascension of that sport has been great. And it's driven the industry to keep producing better and better products. That's the cool yeah. part is that, you know, industry, there's a demand and the industry has responded. Barrels are made better than they ever have before. Optics, obviously bullets, you know, you name it. It's all gotten better. And that's because the demand is there. Yeah. It's really forced, not just us, but yeah, everybody in this sport to, uh, to look at what you're doing and how can you do it better and how can you make it more efficient. And yeah, everybody's benefited greatly and we appreciate the people that think they can spend their way to the top that's fantastic because <laughs> because i because I, I mean you know I, I dream of shooting great in a match and it unfortunately doesn't come true no. so yeah yeah you have to you have to you have to burn out barrels i mean that's a thing i think you guys yeah. need to burn out barrels there's actually a good story i guess that leads into from what you're saying neil too is like in 2012 i actually decided at the beginning of the year that i was going to not really take a hiatus from work, but like make an impacted effort to do really well that year. I, I set aside training days every week. I set aside, I think I shot 12 or 13 matches that year. Um, I know for a fact I shot over 10,000 rounds that year, maybe even yeah. close to 15,000 rounds that year. Um, and it's the one year that I made it to the finale as the top guy. I know the finale ended up being another story. I had, uh, I didn't have a good... Do you have a candy wrapper in your pocket or something like that? No, that's a good story, too. <laughs> that's another no, one. <laughs> I, uh, I just didn't have a good match. I don't think the stress maybe got me, but I ended up fifth for the season and, and yeah. uh, top guy going into it. And that was my best finish, and it takes that commitment. It really does. I mean, mm -hmm. the guys that you see walking the podium, they're not the guys that just show up to the match and load their ammo the night before. I assure you that. If yeah. that happens, it's a fluke. That's me. That's me. Yeah. Not walking the podium, but yeah. the closest the person I know before. who can pull that kind of stuff off is Matt Brousseau. Brantley. I mean, oh. he'll he'll show up and not have shot a round in a year and a half and still make top ten. It's crazy when that guy's really? on it and when he puts his mind to it, it's he's tough to beat. But he can uh, just focus and has you know, muscle memory and remembers yeah. how to do it. And gift Austin Orgain, he shoots a lot. I mean, he he deserves every one he gets. All those guys in Oklahoma. That, other oh, yeah. um, Austin Bushman and Tate and all those guys they they shoot a lot and they've always been tough. Um, yeah, that Oki crew they're they they're pretty tight. I tell yeah. you they and they're good guys. Yeah. But I think you know it, and we can that's that's a whole what sports psychology class I suppose, but I do contend though that if there were 20 people and we decided we wanted them to all start shooting and we gave them all the time, the effort, the resources, only one or two of them maybe make it you know because i think right. there's just some genetic thing that some people have over others but mm -hmm. you know to get in that top 10 at a, ma a na national match i i sure. i personally think that there's some genetic thing there that helps them yeah, you know? well, yeah. i think and the funny thing is is everyone that's a top shooter right now or in the last five years i remember when they sucked like i i, yes, I remember yes, yeah. when they first shot i mean i I was at the first match of most of those guys, if not all of them, maybe yeah. other than Wade. But I remember when me and Wade were first shooting matches and Terry Cross and um, James and John Cranford and some of the guys that you've never heard of because they shot way back in the day. Jacob Bynum, all those guys were top competitors back in the day. They just, you know, they they got busy. They got old. They mm -hmm. They don't, they've lost their eyesight like me and can't see anything. I mean. It's, yeah. You know, but the funny thing is, I can yeah. remember when Jake Vibbert shot his first match. I remember when Scott Sar Satterley fought, shot his first match. In fact, he was on my squad. I remember when Shannon Kay shot his first match. Brousseau, all those guys, I can remember those. And, and I to watch those guys get where they are now, I, I know it's a lot of work and a lot of commitment. It's it's cool to see, and that's where yeah. what spins the whole burnout barrels. Yeah, yeah. got to burn out barrels and make notes and understand what you're doing right and wrong. Yeah, make useful. Yeah, uh, useful application of your time. Not not just shooting rounds down a barrel, but uh, figuring out what you suck at. How can you make it better, and then honing in on that. So what's the uh, you know? So George, back in the day, cartridges. You know what? What was everybody shooting? I assume there's a lot of 308s back originally, and then 
is three oh eight three oh eights predominantly. Um, there wasn't even a detachable magazine for the guns back then, so we all shot top loaders. Most of the stages gave you enough time to you know load or top feed. Um, a lot of those early matches had you know still had stocks and stuff. They were very military orientated. Yeah, uh, targets would be camouflage. You'd have to find targets on the clock, range them with a mill dot reticle, pull out your mill dot mm. master. You know, it's like you know a lot of field craft. I mean, to be honest, they were more true sniper matches to to what we're doing now. Now, yeah, and in fairness, I think if if PRS involved a lot of that, I don't think there'd be as many shooters. No, it just yeah, it'd be it'd be different. I mean, you could probably. I don't know if it would work good in a series, but I think if you had a sniper match and you told him it was a field craft match, you'd still have guys interested in it. You just wouldn't have mm. guys, you know, nationwide building up rigs and you know, knitting up ghillie suits for that type of series. And, you know, back then we all had a ghillie suit. I mean, that was part yeah. of the match. So part of the mix, um, you know, I got sick of getting chiggers all over me, crawling through the bushes for two hours. And, I mean, honestly, like guys would get uh heat stroke and we had to have yeah. ambulance. And we had guys getting IVs at the range back in those days. Yeah, wow. the ghillie. Intense. Well, yeah, you're a Cherborne Ranger, you know, yeah. accountant or whatnot, you know. Yeah, Monday through Friday, and then Saturday you go out and this stuff, you're just not used yeah. to it. And it was a mixture. I mean, lots of military, ex-military guys were competing in it, and there was just some guys who were aficionados that were never in the military, but they always, they, they liked it, or maybe they wanted to be in the military, just never did it. But, you know, most of the PRS guys are, you know, military is a big part of it. The AMU sends three or four of their shooters to almost every match. Uh, lots of yeah. Uh, Army Rangers and SF guys competing in it for practice, you know, to, just to get better at the marksmanship. Um, it's it's a good oh. way to induce stress on yourself, other than getting shot at. It's not the same type of stress. <laughs> yeah. It's not the same type of stress, but it, it it does stress you out to be on the clock and have to do well. So. Oh yeah, yeah. There's no doubt when that buzzer goes off, it's like oh, everything you'd planned. Yeah, gone. Just got punched in the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> so from the 308 then, what happened? I mean, I know, you know, talking to Badly, he shot, what, 300 wind mag? Yeah. He tried it all, right? Yeah, Badly shot an old Savage 300 wind mag. and um, Terry Cross, I think, was the first guy that I remember shooting a 260. Um, him and Jim Clark, you remember him? He, yeah. He uh, he passed away a few years ago. Kind of had a, went too soon as well. But he he him and Terry you know, or a force to be reckoned with back in the day at the team matches. Um, but. those guys started shooting two sixties. And then I think they even went to a two sixty AI, like an Ackley version okay. of it. Yeah. Um, and then I actually started shooting. I can't take credit for being the first person. Cause it was actually a guy who shot for Lapua and probably won't remember his name here at the moment, but, uh, he's a USPSA three gun guy. And he showed up to the match with some factory Lapua 243 one time. I was just intrigued that his gun didn't recoil and he was, you know, basically keeping up with with us at the match. It was actually a match in Texas down at uh, Bill Davison's place, Tac Pro. Yeah, Tac Pro. And I was like, uh, huh, interesting. And then later that year, Tub came out with his 6XC and that 100, 115 yeah. grain bullet. And I was like, I'm going to think I'm going to try this 243 thing. So. I built up a 243 for myself and a couple other guys that I shot with quite a bit, started running them. And as far as I know, that was like the first real foray into the six millimeter. Um, so when was that? That had been like early 2000s, two, two, three, four, <sighs> somewhere like that, right? If I was going to take a stab at, I'd say 03, 04, probably. Yeah. Um, I think that's because I started shooting these matches in early 98. I think, I think there was a couple matches in 97 that Jacob put on that I didn't make. But I, you know, wanted to go. I just didn't have the time off in the police department. But kind of followed what they were doing down there. And then Frank Galley moved his sniper's hide cup to rifles only, and they were doing uh, matches down there. And I started showing up to pretty much every one of those I could. Um, and it, I shot a three hundred eight. I know for sure the first four or five years of that. And then I was probably yeah, probably two thousand four or five. I, I started making my transition to two forty three. And I've never and like two forty three. What happened? Um, so that's where you guys kind of came in. You guys had debuted the yeah. six five Creedmoor, which was ma starting to make a showing in in these matches as well. But uh, I got with John Snow at, in your booth talking about doing an article on wildcatting a cartridge and what that entailed, and we just used the six five Creedmoor and made a six Creedmoor. 
Yeah, Bill- John Snow was with Outdoor Life. Well, still is. Still but is, when, yeah. yeah, he was a, one of the editors for Outdoor Life. And so he, he and George are buds. So they had a conversation. And I think he's covered your stuff numerous times. Yeah. He still does. Yeah, he made he, he had that gun built and wrote an article on the Wildcat of it. And I had this reamer and some brass that you guys had sent me. And uh, I really wanted, yeah, to, make, I really wanted yeah. to make a gas gun work in six millimeter and the 243 is just a little bit too long so i used that reamer and some of that brass you sent and made a gas gun in six creed more and i shot it at a couple matches and then the guys on my team you know brian morgan and shannon and all those guys hey i want that in a bolt gun and mm-hmm. i started doing it in bolt guns and i probably built 30 or 40 guns for competitors and then some guys on frank's side on sniper side and Kind of saw the caliber being a nice low recoil and thing, so I did a uh, gave Jason a call and said, "What would it take to to make brass that says six cream more on it?" And I always, you know how Jason is, he's like, "No, take an order for about a hundred thousand, I think." <laughs> and so yeah, and then we'll make it for you. <laughs> yeah, and so I, I I placed the order, and you guys made the brass, and we sold that brass for a few years, and that cartridge got really big, and you guys finally had put it through Sammy and. Did yeah. you have? Did you sell it first, or did we? I don't know. We sold the did brass. Sell we ammo? sold the brass first, and then okay. when you guys came out with the ammo, I think you guys let me sell it for a year. But uh, you guys spent that year figuring out what you're going to do on the hunting side and other stuff with it. And then you guys launched it yeah. effectively yeah. at the shot show the following year. But it's been a it's been a little bit popular. It's been a little popular, and to kind of back up a little bit before we talk about the Six Creedmoor and other cartridges. What I really enjoy about not just you specifically, George, but the company GA Precision and you individually is you seem to be an enthusiast at heart still. You know, we're... Oh, yeah. He's you know, a, and he's a tinker. He's always playing around with... Yeah, you know, you're more than two decades yeah. into the industry if, if GA Precision started in 1999 right. and you're still an enthusiast, you're still a competitor, you're still wanting to wildcat things and that's really benefited... The, the industry as a whole, but Hornady specifically, because the relationship that you have with Hornady, we've really been able to get your uh, expert opinion on how things feed and how things uh, function and design some really cool cartridges with your input. Now, the six Creedmoor, was that the first one that we... Yeah, had? that's the first one when we had some kind of a collab, really. Yeah, because since then, there's been several more. Yeah, there's been a couple more since then. Um, but yeah, the six screen were again, you know, this, these are the, some of the cool industry stories. Cause I think we'd all agree that all, all of us are still 18 year old us that think what we do is pretty cool. So to, to have any kind of, you know, view or uh, place in, in, in some of these things coming to be is, is really cool. Now on the six screen more, I bet you that was probably John Snow probably called and talked to Steve Johnson at the time, who was our, who did what you do now okay. back then. And he would have probably gotten those cases down to, to George. And then there was probably a little black op internal stuff to get with Ben Searing to make some dies. And then, and, but that's how it came to be and uh, turned out to be a fantastic addition to our match line. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty obviously fantastic. And the six Creedmoor, obviously that's, you know, one of our more popular cartridges since then though, uh, another one that's probably not long after uh, was a podcast we just released the 6.5 prc podcast which uh well i do need to i do need to uh point out though that george i think you might have made the first 300 prc that wasn't made yeah you know, by chamber in a barrel here <laughs> yeah. first production that was yeah a, yeah that was a we'll have to call that one the neil cartridge i guess i'm not sure who <laughs> made the original reamer in house but neil uh had sent a reamer out here and some very clandestine ammo with no uh head stamp <laughs> no head stamps and yeah. has had me chamber up a hunting gun which yeah. nicknamed the god gun <laughs> and uh, yeah. you even remember what year that was it I, I no not offhand but it was a while back it well, was like so 2012 was when we that was maybe 20 c was the 300 was six five six five was 2012 well, when you first spoke to george oh it was 2012 so it was about song. yeah oh okay for the six five yeah, prc the six five so it was before that it must have been in 10 or something i don't yeah, know i'd have to look it up but but so joe uh joe it's a 375 ruger cartridge case 
but they needed something to test bullets and they were shooting lots of bench rest stuff. So that cartridge case made a lot of sense for them. So they were necking it down to 30 and shooting it. And then I had to talk with Dave Emery because I was hunting on a kind of a, a thin but long stretch of land and I wanted something to make sure that the deer weren't going to make the fence. So it was mm-hmm. like, do I want a Lapua or do I want it? And Dave's like, no, you got to use this. So that's what, that's what I did. So yeah. yeah, that's cool. So yeah, George uh, probably built the first one that wasn't chambered here anyways. Yeah, I was going to say Joe Thielen would have uh, designed that reamer print in 2007 and yeah. the, you know, the reamer print was a match dimensioned reamer yeah quote unquote match dimension and so every gun ever chambered in that thing tends to just shoot like well and out. and the guys that are in engineering and the lab and the, you know they they can kind of make a few things here and there so yeah they would run a, a, a run a 375 brass and then let's just make some that are neck down to 30 and we won't worry about head stamping them so yeah it's kind of <laughs> cool we got no no head stamp brass yeah it's kind of cool but yeah so then fast forward sure so now we get into the 65 PRC and I think is it 2012 is that when we did this? Yeah. So George, you oh, and I talked at SHOT Show, if I remember, you, you, it was, you were going through this. And- so I looked at cartridge cases that were currently out there and specifically the 300 RCM, which is the short, uh, you know, Ruger compact mag and I knew that the, the volume of that case would make a really good parent for a 6.5 you know, short Magnum. And the, and the whole reason for doing one wasn't because it hadn't already been done. There was some short, you know, Magnum size six, five cases from back in the day, like the six, five Winchester and the six, five Remington Magnum, but you know, one without a belt and one that would specifically toss, you know, one forty class bullet to 3,200 feet a second, which is the, the ceiling for PRS. This was um, the phase of PRS for me when you was trying to game the the ballistics you know i wasn't thinking about recoil but what could you ballistically you know game the, the match with so 65 caliber is going to offer the highest bc that you can get to 3200 in a short action um so i talked to you at the shot show i think it was mentioned to jason but you can correlate this event with the the school shooting in newtown connecticut because that was the year you guys got swamped with 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 that fiasco and um yeah that was one of the massive spikes in demand and so i think i i went and found you like all the cases i could that were in 300 rcm which wasn't a whole lot i think you actually pulled them out of the out of the testing lab downstairs once fired or something yeah Yeah. and uh (laughs) (laughs) and i had a reamer made it was just a full length the 30 rcm neck to 65 and i built a gun um i shot it it was everything i I thought it would be, and uh, I went to Jason about making brass for that, and he's like, "Man, there's just no way." I mean, we're it'd be, it'd be literally like trying to call him and have something like that made, you know, in ni- nineteen or or early twenty. Just you know, you guys are swamped. So I started calling around and looking for different cases, and ultimately bought eighty thousand pieces of brass from Remington, and 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 just came out with the six five Psalm. Um, that that worked out well. We shot it for a couple of years, and uh, finally Jason called me and said, "Actually, you, you're actually probably going to remember this." He's like, "What? What did we? Uh, we actually sat down at the table there in in the headquarters Good building enough. at Hornady." And Jason says, "What we? What's it got to take to to bring that to life? You know, this six five song thing's doing pretty well. I want to I want to do what you originally wanted to do." So, which was a better mousetrap, and it yeah, would work and, better for hunting rifles in particular. Yeah, and, I, and I, I really, you know, was only worried about guys we'd already built some rifles for. And Jason said he would always support the brass for that. So it, it, it fixed the, the customers that we built. You know, we built hundreds and hundreds of rifles in that other caliber. So I want to make sure those guys were still supported. Yeah, because we do make 6.5 Arsam brass for them. And then there was literally the, the, the making of a cartridge that wouldn't fit in the other one and would you know wouldn't accidentally get put in a psalm and the psalm wouldn't accidentally mm-hmm. get put in the in what ended up being the 65 prc and uh so the prc yeah, Joe was had to do some design you know had to design that cartridge such that yeah they yeah. wouldn't have that so it's a little bit longer than the psalm so it's, it's not as so a psalm can't fit in a prc because it's too big but prc 
could have effectively fit in a psalm if they didn't make it a little bit longer. So so it's long, just long enough where you couldn't accidentally size it down too far and fit it in a in a in a psalm. And then uh, I think he extended the neck just a little bit. So it's basically an RCM case, but it's been short. Yeah, extended the neck. the neck just so you get a little more barrel life. Correct. Shortened the shoulder and, and extended the neck a little bit. Uh, it's a great cartridge. I mean, it's it's literally like probably the number one asked for cartridge in our shop for hunting rifles now. Like it's not yeah. even, there's nothing else even close. So, yeah, and then we just we we just filmed the podcast on the six five pure C. I suppose that'll come out for this one. Just, not, just launched. Okay, so it just launched today, but. Yeah, on the hunting side, you know, it's, and I maybe I use this in that in that one too. But you know, we used to call the six five Creedmoor lightning in a bottle. Well, now it's the scale of reference is such that the six five PRC is lightning in a bottle. So that makes make the six five Creedmoor a lightning storm in a bottle. But the six five PRC is extremely popular. Yeah, and that's one thing we spoke about in that podcast was there's obviously match applicability to a 6.5 PRC and you can still shoot it in a lot of matches, ELR matches, but I didn't know if, if anybody thought that the 6.5 PRC would become kind of the dominant, dominant yeah. hunting cartridge right. uh, of the last couple of years, because our, our hunting ammunition skews, uh, you know, everything's back ordered now, but the volume of back order, it greatly exceeds that of the match ammunition skews. Yeah, for precision hunter. Our precision hunter ammo in the 6.5 PRC is just, uh, it's it's money. It shoots well from a, a variety of different rifles. The bullet obviously works wonderful on anything from, you know, elk to antelope. Uh, and it really has really set itself up for hunting success. I mean, but it, it really just, it's, And it's a cool story. I mean, how it came to be... It was delayed. I mean, it sure could have happened in 2013, 2012, but just the market circumstances were such that everybody was producing as much as they possibly could and, and focusing on the most demanded products and mm -hmm. variety in your manufacturing process is limited at that point in time. Because, you know, once you take a machine that's running, let's say 30-06 and you need to run some 270s, well, you got to stop, as you know. Yeah. You got to stop making 30-06, retool, now you're making 270s, whatever. So, and it, making that brass for kind of a smaller run at the time just wasn't feasible yeah. for us. Even though that's a specialty for our company and always has been, just the timing then was, was not right. right. Which is unfortunate because it would have been cool to come out of that right out of the gate. You know, I, I'm not sure because I could see how because it was delayed, it allowed the market for all the auxiliary equipment uh, that goes into a cartridge to increase. So now you have this cartridge that's faster, it's flatter than <laughs> a 6.5 crew runner, bucks the wind a little bit better. And now laser range finders, you can, you know, you can range things at thousands of yards yeah. right now. And, and you grab a scope turret and you make it one click adjustment and it adjusts a tenth of the mill. You know, like everything has gotten really, really high in quality and more affordable, which is a unique uh, dichotomy that you don't normally get. So, you know, by delaying it, now you have the ultimate kind of extended range, medium sized game hunting cartridge, and you've got optics and range finders and stocks and actions and barrels to go with it. Oh yeah. It was kind of a perfect storm for when it was released, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and the popularity of the Psalm actually helped PRC because most most people yeah. that were following it from inception knew that the their RCM case was the case that I really wanted to use. It just just didn't work out that way. But people are still happy with their songs and people love the PRC and it worked out to be way more of a hunting caliber, you know, for Hornady than it is probably in a PRS type caliber. There's still guys that shoot it in PRS matches. I pick up brass after matches and kind of look at what people are shooting. To me, that's the best way. You can pick up a big old pile. Especially the matches where it rains and everyone's leaving the stuff on the ground anyway. You can yeah. kind of get a cross section of what everyone shoot is shooting these days. And there's still, you know, a handful of guys shooting the PRC at matches. And it's the guys who just like the target to move a lot and see the splash really well when it hits the dirt. So um it's 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 turned out to be a hell of a cartridge and it's really the only thing I've hunted with over the last six yeah. or seven years. So yeah, and that's a good perspective, George. That that the six five psalm only helped springboard the six five PRC, and that's that's probably true. Yeah, because the 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 commercially the the commercial cartridge was going to be what turned out to be the six five PRC, mm -hmm. and then the the Wildcat remained where it was. And it 
and it is a good cartridge. It's just like, it doesn't, it's got a rebated rim. So feeds fine from a box mag, you know, detachable mag system, but yep. not so great off of a, something with the standard top line. Load. Yeah. Top loader. Yeah. It's definitely the top loader guys, like the P the PRC really helps them get a good, uh, bolt, you know, contact. So it feeds really well. So anything that's rebated, you're basically cutting down on how much that rim contacts the bolt for feeding and, that's why the SOM cartridges, heck, I know gunsmiths that won't even build, you know, blind mag or BDL style guns on any of the SOM or rebated rim cartridges. So uh, the PRC family of cartridges allow for them to be put either way and feed just phenomenally. So, mm-hmm. Yep. And George, you and I shared elk camp here last year and you, you killed an elk 6.5 PRC. Yep. Uh, from what I remember, it wasn't horribly far away, but it wasn't. Nah, what I call traditional range. Three, 340 or something, if I remember right. Yeah, 340 yards, 6.5 PRC on a, on a really slick setup, if I say so myself. Really <laughs> nice uh, equipped rifle, shorter barrel suppressor. And yeah, Seth, Seth and short barrel. So yeah, here we go. 143 <laughs> ELDX. Seth had his way, yeah. they'd all stop at 20 inches, I think. Well, yeah. I'm just to the point, though, that you have one of the premier gun builders in the world and he is choosing to shoot a 6.5 PRC on an elk hunt. When we get that question oh, a lot. Oh, yeah, every people... every year. I get it, like, a lot. And, you know, guys are uh, – Neil knows part of this story, and it's it's kind of fun to tell because it's, it's, it's one that repeats itself quite a bit, you know, over different species. But I had a, a client that came in here that went to a fundraiser and purchased a buffalo hunt. Mm-hmm. And um, – wasn't really a hunter. Um, so she came in here and wanted to buy two rifles for a buffalo hunt. The buffalo hunt was like literally a month away. Wanted to know if we could outfit her with a couple of rifles. And uh, lo and behold, I actually had a few builder hunting rifles going through the shop. And I told her, well, as long as you buy one of these guns that we almost have finished, we should be able to get those guns done uh, in time for your hunt. Um, so she's like, let's do it. We, we, you know, she didn't know anything about caliber. She just assumed that I knew she was going on a buffalo hunt. So she ordered the guns. We got them finished. I actually basically talked her into to doing a half day course with Sykes just to familiarize herself with a rifle and how to shoot it because it was pretty obvious to me that she had been around guns but not hunting so much. So sure. Sykes took her on a course. Well, when she talked to the outfitter and told the outfitter she was bringing a 6.5 PRC, he freaked out and said, no, it's absolute minimum of a 30 out 6. And I, I kind of chuckled because she called me freaking out. Well, this gun's not going to work. It's not a thirty out six. I'm like, well, you're right. It's not. But you know, no uh, offense, but most outfitters don't know much about ballistics. The 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 energy on target from a six five PRC versus a thirty out six is pretty grossly in favor of the six five PRC. I said, don't worry about it. The, the gun will kill a buffalo, no problem. Like absolutely zero problems. And um, She's like, okay, well, if you say so, I'm like, trust me, I put, I'm putting my word on it. I, like, I 100% know you're not going to have an issue. So after I said that, I started thinking to myself, man, if she like has an issue, I'm the guy. So <laughs> yeah. I, I knew, I knew because you guys let me in on stuff before it actually happens that you guys were coming out with the CX in 6.5 PRC. So I called Neil. I'm like, man, can you send me some, uh, some, yeah. some uh, CX? PRC and he's like, well, don't tell him what it is. I'm like, well, she won't know. I mean, it looks yeah. like an average person would be it's able a to tell the difference. Yeah. So Sykes, I remember sending those. Out. Yeah. 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 So Sykes, it's like, look, don't put it. Don't. They don't need to know about what this is because yeah, we hadn't we hadn't announced that yet. So Sykes uh, got her guns, you know, sighted in at at 200 yards with the CX 65 uh, PRC, and she went out there, and not only did they kill their two buffalo, I think they ended up killing like three a piece and none of them went none of them went more than like 12 or 13 yards and the and the guide ended up making the comment to her that he'd never seen those buffalo be killed so quickly like he made that comment and and it and to back that up uh tom fuller went on a buffalo hunt in south dakota earlier in the year and i happened to run into the fellow that he went hunting with at the Dallas Safari Club show, and he introduced himself as being Tom's Buffalo guy. And I'm like, hey, have you ever had 
someone shoot a buffalo in your place with a 6.5 PRC? And he's like, as a matter of fact, he's like, normally I would cringe at a 6.5 on my place too, because I told him the story. He's like, but that 6.5 PRC, I remember that. That guy, when he shot that buffalo, it just dropped, and that never happened. So Yeah, it's a, gi- it's a giant killer. Yeah. Although I have to say that CX bullet was a good call. I think, oh, yeah, 100%. If, I, if I was going to do, if, yeah, CX would be a great call, regardless of cartridge or, you know, configuration, that'd be a great one for a buffalo. I mean, my thing is it's a very thick, heavy boned animal. I mean, oh, yeah. there's a bullet that's specific to that type of uh, animal. The CX would be right there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and great testimonial. Great, uh, yeah. great early test of the bullet, quite honestly. Well, and yeah, not just the cartridge and kind of tangential to... Uh, what we're talking about, the CX bullet, though, s- specifically the 130 grain for the 6.5 PRC. Yeah. I mean, you get all the shape drag benefits of a really sexy match bullet and then the terminal performance in spades. Uh, yeah, because that's designed for that cartridge, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what we did it for. Yep. Yeah. And then the 190 for the 300, right? So, yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of unique uh, bullet offerings that we did just for them. Yeah. So cartridge-wise... There's uh, another. There's another one, George. What's yeah. this, what's the other one? There's another <laughs> so the, cartridge that's out the there. The most the most recent one, um, the six millimeter GT, was another like solution for. I'll, I'll say a solution for a problem for for me as a gun builder. Not necessarily a solution to a problem period, but um, the Dasher and all the BR deriv- der- uh, derivatives. Um, have become very popular for an obvious reasons are super crazy accurate. They, they have very light recoil for the movement in the stages where you really want to see your own trace and definitely your own splash. There's, there's definitely a, a, a reason guys shoot those, but at the same time, um, they do not feed correctly. I mean, they will feed when manipulated the magazines correctly and stuff, but that you drop, you have a customer that buys a $5,000 rifle he drops his magazine and bends the lip a little bit. And the tune that we put on the magazine now, his gun doesn't feed and he's calling us. Um, at the same time, I can tune a magazine that works really well, but he wants a couple more mags. He buys them off of so-and-so.com and they're not tuned to that cartridge. And now he's got feeding problems. It's just for me uh, to be able to provide a rifle that I know is going to feed flawlessly to a customer that those BR cartridges just don't resonate well. So I got in a conversation with, with, Tom Jacobs, who is a 600,000 yard bench rest shooter. He's got a lot of knowledge on the, the BR cases and the Dasher and, and such. And started talking to him about, Hey, what if we came up with a caliber that kind of combined the best of both worlds? You know, he, the Dasher doesn't have hardly any neck and that's the biggest complaint of it. Um, let's give the Dasher some more neck and see if we can make it feed better. Cause the cartridge is, you know, you'll be able to extend the bullet out a little bit more, which is the problem. The overall length of the case is so short, it won't come out of the mag and into the chamber. That mm. gap, that bridge gap where it comes out of the magazine and starts into the chamber is what you're trying to overcome. And we looked at that and it still wasn't going to be long enough. So essentially the six millimeter GT is a dasher with hundred thousands longer body, 50 thousands longer neck and a 35 degree shoulder instead of a 40. And all those reasons have to do with feeding, nothing else. Mm. It's not to make it more powerful, really, even though you can with a little bit more case capacity, it wasn't really to make it more accurate. Um, we didn't take anything away from it to, to leave it in that category of super efficient with, you know, target grade powders to be super accurate. It just solved the problem that now gunsmiths can build a gun and have, and know for sure that it's going to feed flawlessly with, with all the mags that are out there. So the name GT is just George and Tom were the ones that came up with it. We bought a bunch of, of a six, five by 47 Lapua brass. Cause it had the small primer and we could short, it was already shorter than a 308. So we shortened that up, uh, necked it all down, trimmed the necks. Me and him shot it kind of clandestinely for a year just to make sure it did all the things we thought it would do. And then, uh, I kind of kept you guys abreast of everything I was doing with it. Cause obviously my intent was to have you guys produce brass and ultimately ammunition if it all worked out. And that's kind of what happened. So after a year, I placed the first brass order, uh, Jason approved it. We got the brass in, um, we sold over a million pieces of brass by now. And then this year you guys put it through Sammy and are allowing me to, to sell commercially loaded ammunition in it. So it, it, it it really has taken off. Um, 
In fact, some other satire website has has given it a, a, an an interesting name that's taken off. I'm not so sure why it's taken off, but it's kind of funny. And um, and at any rate, it has a it has a kind of a cult following on both sides under both names. So yeah, yeah it does. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. It Al- does. Al- Alpha. I think that's who you get to blame for that. Well, yeah. Alpha helped promote it. It actually wasn't Alpha. I won't. <laughs> I won't out the go- guilty culprit. But uh, okay, yeah, good. <laughs> um, if you if you want to get a good chuckle sometime, if you go to Facebook, there's a, a satire page called the American Rifle Series, which just kind of oh, sp- that's who did it. Okay. Which just kind of spoofs everything shooting and makes fun of like a lot of stuff that people want to make fun of, but are but won't do it. I mean, it's it's a funny site, and they. Yeah. Made some pretty funny pictures of me and other things, and <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and that's and that's taken over as its alter ego. Yeah, right? but then, then yeah. obviously, so the the GT is is real. You are the 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 source for it all. Anybody out there is looking for six GT, got to go get with the GA right now. That's who you need to talk to. Yeah, but it is officially Sammy approved. There's yes. no yeah. doubt about that. There are standard dimensions. There are standard Reamer dimensions. There's pressure and velocity there's ammunition available now through george uh and it is totally standardized yeah. yeah and then the other thing that came out of that was the 109 grain ELD match bullets that was another one that that happened uh, largely due to the gt sort of but that was like unbeknownst to me something that i didn't know you guys kind of were already doing i was on a squad that, with uh i'm gonna miles uh, with miles yeah, yeah. I his name with miles at the finale and he was probably shooting an arc. Think, he, was shooting he? An arc. Yeah. he was shooting an arc. He was shooting an arc. And uh, we just got to talking about different stuff. And I mentioned, you know, it'd be nice to have the the sleekness of an A-tip in a in an ELD M, you know, plastic tip bullet, you know, for a couple of reasons, the affordability of it, especially for practicing. You know, you could shoot a lot of those and then switch to the A-tips for the match and, and not break, break the bank. And uh, he's like, well, you know, the... 106 grain bullet is that same shape and i'm like the 106 you know what the hell is that and uh yeah, it, it happened to be a bullet that you guys only do in the law enforcement military side of the house so most of us like including me knew nothing about it mm-hmm. yeah i mean it's that that bullet's a little different because it's a it's a specialty yeah so there's made. some stuff on the internal uh dimensions of that bullet that make it what it Correct. is but externally like you said george yeah, yeah it's got the same uh, uh, draw punch series and OGI profile as the 110 A tip. Yeah. So Miles, being as smart as Miles is, like he said, well, if we if we drew a match jacket and use that sequence, it'd probably be one. It'd probably be a 109. Like I, I'm assuming he just guessed either that or they they actually done it and he already knew. But um, probably the latter. Yeah. And he, yeah. And so I got super intrigued about it. And I, I don't even think I was off out of the truck and into my house and calling Neil and Joe Teal. And I'm like, hey, yeah, is that something like, you guys could do? Like, uh, is this something that's like even possible? And I don't know, maybe December that year, a mystery box showed up of a bunch of them to check out. And I, I started shooting them and was kind of amazed that really to a thousand yards ballistically, they, they match up with the one ten A tip really well. It's just a one ten A tip really takes off and just sp- shows its wings you know, post eight ninety nine hundred yards to twelve hundred, it's it's really yep. sings. It just it becomes a little bit more consistent at those longer ranges. But for PRS, being that ninety percent of our shots are eight hundred and in, like it's just the perfect bullet. You guys were able to load that bullet for me in the GT, which is really cool. So, yeah, it is an amazing bullet, and and you hit the nail on the head with the A tip. There's a lot of things that make it good, uh, but. It's consistency at really extended range yeah. uh, when it's had, you know, a lot of time of flight. The consistency of its drag characteristics yeah, it's are, yeah, they're unrivaled in the industry. The The drag variability is the lowest that you're going to see. And so you don't get that vertical dispersion that you get on any other bullet, uh, ours included. Just the right. A-tip is the ultimate in consistency. It That's is. See that. and, and it shows, I mean, we'll jump to something that I'm just, a very small part of, but it, it interests me from a ballistic side is the ELR game. It's not a big game. There's not a lot of people shooting it. There's very few places that can even put on those matches. Um, there's maybe a couple hundred people nationwide that are super serious about it. And only maybe 80 of those compete on 
with any regularity. It's kind of like the same thing I was talking about in 97 for our game now. It's just kind of in its infancy, but the the big A tips, i.e. the 416 and 375s, um, hold all the longest shots in competition right now. It's like, so all the ones over yeah. 3,000, which is crazy to even imagine. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Cheney, uh, Jacqueline Bryan, and and Robert Brantley all hold those what they call records in competition, like it's the longest shots actually while you're on the clock, and uh, they're all with A tips currently. Hmm. So, I mean, something to be said there. Might I'd, be some, might be something there, huh? There might be. I mean, it's great yeah. to see a gigantic splash when those things hit, where the the solid copper bullets are, you know, super accurate, and they they definitely have been making leaps and bounds and different bullet manufacturers and that, uh, and that type of bullet, but they are hard to see, especially when they hit dirt, they, they just kind of go right. right in and they don't expand much yeah, or bore a hole. When, when you hit a, a piece of steel with an A tip, you know, cup and core bullet, or when it hits the ground and comes apart, it's, it's very noticeable. And that's a big part of that shooting because, you know, you're not actually hitting the target with the first round with regularity. I mean, there are guys that make first round impacts, but if you look at the cold bore shots at any of those matches, there's a very low percentage of hits. So you're, you're pretty much counting on seeing the bullet impact somewhere and making that correction to get on with the second or third shot and the A tips and being a cup and core bullet, make it a lot easier. Yeah. Um, and it's just tough to make it. You, you can make a better bullet by using a cup and core. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Product. I mean, well, you, you can, can, you, you can, can control different, the mass distribution the build, yeah. is, is huge. You can put some mass where you want it that helps it uh, with stability and, and being a little bit more forgivingly accurate that way. I get, so, you know, we, we talked a lot about match stuff, George, but I think, you know, a lot of people probably don't understand how passionate you are about hunting and Alaska in particular, and you kind of have an affinity for Montana and all that. I just, I really got an affinity for out West, like low population where there's lots of you know, fresh air and, and open space. And, you know, I've done my share of hunting out of a blind and waiting for a white tail to walk underneath it. I'm just, and I can't even remember the last time I'd done it really. And it used to be my thing, but, uh, once I got out West and, and got to walking around and hiking and spending hours on glass from a hilltop, you know, looking for, for an elk or a deer to, to make a stock on. I just, I just, there's nothing like that to me. And, you know, I love to fish too. And the, yeah. the stream and lake fishing out West is, you know, depending on what species, obviously is just a lot different than out here. So I've kind of fallen in love with that. In fact, I get on a flight tomorrow to go to Alaska to go fishing with a good buddy of mine. Um, and I, I just can't wait to get there because this is yeah. like prime time for halibut and king salmon. So. And George, George shot a really big doll sheep once. So every yeah. time he... He likes to show the photo to Steve Hornady just to rub it in because his <laughs> well, is bigger than Steve's. The, the funny thing was, is I actually talked to Steve about sheep hunting before I met, went on that trip because I knew Steve had been hunting sheep and goats all over the world. In fact, I, I've never seen a collection of goat and sheep like his. And so he was showing me the the collection of sheep in his office, which are his, I think his four best rams. And I was talking to him about where I was going and stuff. And I ended up coming back there after my hunt, after talking to him before. And he, he was, I was telling him I got a good sheep and he's like, Hey, let's see it. And I pulled out my phone and showed it to him. And I won't say exactly what he told me on the air. But <laughs> it was, it was basically like, yeah, like whatever. <laughs> but, <laughs> I hate you. Yeah. That's what it was. <laughs> Something like that. I can that. turn this around. That sheep is proudly in my office up here on the wall. I get to oh look, yeah. I get to look at it every day. So it ended up Man. being Boone and Crockett sheep the first time I ever went. So really yeah. ah, good for you. So of the, of the adventures that you've had around the country and around the world hunting, is there a specific animal that, that really turns your crank or is there just a specific style of hunting I think it's, regardless of what the animal is? I think it's the style. I mean, it's, you know, the sheep hunting versus the elk hunting versus the mule deer hunting and even black bear, especially in the spring. It's, it's all the type of hunting I like to do, you know, getting to a, a good position 
to glass from having a large, vast amount of land to hunt on, you know, not just hunting on a hundred acres of timber and a deer stand. I mean, you're hunting the, the lease that I have in Montana is 15,000 acres, which is actually small. Um, in, in retrospect, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, hard to relate. I mean, that's the perfect place to go hunt. You have, you know, this gigantic, it's like a painting. It's this gigantic palette that you have and you can sit anywhere on that, on that canvas and, and, and make a, make your hunt or your art. So I just think it's cool to, to sit back and watch, you know, find, find the animal you're after and figure out a plan of how to get to them and make that shot. So, you know, the cartridges and the ballistics help you not have to get as close nowadays, but it's the whole, yeah. you know, being out in the open and spot and stock, I, I, any of that's the type of hunting and the species are yeah. ir- irrelevant. I mean, uh, yeah, there's a lot that goes into what you just said there that, that shapes the hunt is not necessarily about hunting and killing the animal. It's about the experience as a whole, sure. uh, immersed in such a, a, a vast place and where the pursuit seems so unattainable because how could anything live out here? I can see for three miles or whatever. And then, sure. yeah, to burn a hole through a pair of glass, you know, like you're, like you're trying to find the, the flick of an ear and then the spot and the stock and it becomes decreasingly less about the uh actual individual animal you're hunting and more about the experience sure. of everything that goes into it i think the, the adrenaline dump from a sheep hunt um you know everyone knows brian sykes and i are really close friends and he got to go on that hunt with me he actually shot a caribou on that hunt where i went sheep hunting and we we sheep hunted for a little over a week almost two weeks and then we took a break went to caribou hunting and brown bear hunting and Brian got his caribou and we went back into sheep camp. And this is all on horseback. Um, the caribou we flew in, but, uh, we rode close to 20 miles one way in along this, you know, this, this big, huge drainage. And so we were at the very bottom along this river camping and spotting up into the mountains from, from camp. And basically was explained to me by the guide the whole time that the sheep need to come into this basin and they, they come in here for a reason. There's water in it. There's no, there's no other water up there except in the space. And when they come into there, that they stay in there. So I would get up every morning and just watch these sheep all over these, you know, high peaks in the scree and none of them would ever go in that basin. And, you know, it's, it was fun to be there. And of course we bear hunted during the day as well. But this one morning when I got up, before they'd even cook breakfast or anything, I'm watching these sheep and the set group of four rams. And I knew there was a really good one in this group walked into that basement. And before they could even like step 10 yards into it, I'm like running into the back into the camp. Here. Let's go. <laughs> I'm like, Let, let's go. Let's get, get your our stuff. boots on. Let's go. I don't know if it was my fault, but like the guy ended up like literally forgetting to put his hiking boots on. He climbed that mountain. This is how tough these guides are. He climbed that mountain in a set of rubber boots. Oh gosh. And it's, yeah. we spent four and a half, five hours climbing probably 3,600 feet of vertical to get up on top, you know, past tree line. Neil's walked in it a lot, this stuff called scree, which is just shaly rock that's, that's wadded up on the side of a mountain. And when we got to that, there was no way to get any further. It's impossible. The sheep are like, we're literally looking in our direction and we have no cover. So I, the guide knew we could shoot and uh he's like i'm like we're shooting from here man he's like how far is i'm like a little over 800 and i'm like but it's gonna happen and so we spent i bet a better part of 20 30 minutes preparing for the shot getting you know a big base of rocks and my pack set up on the rifle and me and sykes using both our kestrels the dope to win like together talking yeah, about two, it. two highly accomplished shooters so yeah. i mean brian Brian will probably be on this podcast at some he point too. Sure. Highly accomplished, former uh, Green Beret. Yeah. yeah, he's done a he's done a few things. But anyway, five sorry five or six minutes go by of us deciding which wind hold we'd use because there was a lot of wind coming up through this draw, but we couldn't really tell it from where we were how it was hitting the side of this canyon and kind of blowing right across in front of these sheep. You couldn't see it. There's not any trees blowing around. Scree doesn't move, and at that angle. You know, shooting up 800 yards is like 23 or 24 degrees straight up. I literally entered like almost at his belly and came out the top of his, the very top of his shoulder. Just anchored him right there in place. So, of of course, you can 
imagine a bunch of high fives and screaming and yelling like you feel yeah. like you just conquered Mount Everest, but it doesn't even come close to the feeling and emotions you get when you walk the, the rest of that time up to the animal and you get to it. Like I start bawling. I don't even cry. I don't cry at funerals. Like I, I'm, my wife gives me crap when I go to funerals. I just don't, I can't conjure up a tear, but that one moment, like I was bawling like a little kid. So I would say that one time in that experience, there was nothing ever like that in a hunting. So I guess if back to your question, Seth, that would be my, my one hunt to remember. I don't think it could ever be topped. Yeah, wow. that's cool. That is, yeah, that's just an incredible experience. And shooting a 6.5 PRC six or 6.5 six five song? 6.5 PRC. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's a great story. Yeah, Speaking of the PRC, that's our next event coming up. So we'll be rallying up out in uh, Utah for the Hornady Precision Rifle Challenge yep. uh, PRS match and mm-hmm. weekend after 4th of July. Yep. So George, and, a- George and Brian are the match directors, and it's it's kind of a labor of love, but they do a really good job with it. Amazing job. Well, I was going to say, what they do a really good job of is making me realize how bad I <laughs> am. <laughs> That's Jeez, tough. that is a, I, and it may not be something that the match director set up to, you know, sabotage stages where you know you're going to do bad. Could just be the venue that it's a challenging place to shoot as a whole, I think. But they do a phenomenal job of, I can't even imagine the work that goes into just that one match. Well, George, George came, we, we, we brought George out there to go hunting one time and it, I kind of thought this would be a, we need to try to run a match out here. I mean, that's, that's part of the, my goal anyway, is to try to make sure we're engaged in as many shooting, uh, you know, things, things. Just, yeah. yeah. I mean, if two guys are shooting in a pasture. We want to have a part of that, but you know, we wanted to have a signature event for the precision rifle series. And George came out there and I think we just, I don't know. We talked about it for a year or two or something like that. I think George, I don't remember exactly what happened, but well, first it was finding the location and that, that area of the ranch was actually where I hunted when I came out there. Um, yeah. For deer, for deer. Uh, yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's not in the mountainous portion of it, but it's definitely not in the prairie either. It's kind of that transitional area of the ranch where it turns from what everyone would, would consider, you know, piney Aspen mountains into uh, you know, high, high desert, desert, big sage, very large rock outcroppings. And um, this specific spot has two ridges that run kind of perpendicular to each other with a little bit of a V aspect to it. And you have all that ground in between the two that makes for a perfect static range, which ultimately you guys wanted for for clients and and just doing you know shooting and doping the rifles out there so that that ended up getting built and then that the near ridge we basically made a golf course type setting of 18 holes of shooting going up that ridge and back down and that ridge has you know lots of natural things to shoot off and we added more natural things to shoot off of we even found an old uh uh cart and buggy from way back oh yeah that old yeah that old uh yeah turn of the century yeah, kind of yeah. Stuff. so we we use that as a prop now um of course we added some some hornady h features to it um there's a big large gigantic rock rock outcropping at the end of this that overlooks a a lake it's beautiful and yeah. it's beautiful and you get to shoot off those rocks over the lake along the shoreline which is it just it's one of those places you go to shoot and it it's like you know, going to a Tom Watson golf course and, you know, the beauty of some of those courses, it's, it's a golf course shooting range kind of. And, and I hear, cause I've talked to those guys numerous times over the last two weeks that they've got an um, abundance of rain this year and it is super green this year. Oh, cool. Like mm, that's good. Very, a little less dust, maybe. <laughs> very, yeah, less dust, but it's a lot greener than normal. Um, yeah. I'm all right with the less dust thing. I've, Probably means I'm going to have to do a lot of mowing when I get there on a... Uh, <laughs> get the weed eater out. Yeah. yeah. I've got clothes and shoes and a, a bag that are still tinted red. Oh, you just yeah. use them again this year. That's the You'll plan. I couldn't get them clean, so I was like, I'll just use those next yes. year. <laughs> North Texas and Oklahoma are not the only places with red dirt. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's red dirt in Georgia, but the wind doesn't blow that much, so you no. don't have to worry about it as badly there. No, we're looking forward to it, George. I think the reason Seth talks about it being a very challenging course, which is, you know, it's an AG Cup match. It's 
it's the best of the best are at this match that's so supposed to be challenging is the fact that you get to shoot 240 degrees there like you start shooting uh kind of towards the north on stage one and you transition to shooting almost due west to stage nine and then you're shooting almost due south to southeast from nine to to uh 19 so it's you don't the only direction you really don't shoot a ton of is directly south east i guess so yeah you don't shoot much east yeah no. well and and so yeah you not only do you get to experience all the wind in in a 245 degree arc but there's also little canyons and cuts and you get some wind gradient going on and you've got yeah a lot, of, a lot of vertical wind going on. <laughs> and Seth and I shot with the Oklahoma guys last year. So, yeah. you know, your, your your expectations are that you need to shoot as well as those guys. And yeah. No, we're mortals. Not so. going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you're racked up to shoot with the Oklahoma guys again, Neil. So. Uh, good. Well, thank Yeah. Hopefully I don't have to ever shoot first. <laughs> well, let's see. You, can, you got time to practice yeah, after this podcast. Yeah. Better get yeah. out there. Better get on it. <laughs> awesome. Is there anything else we, we want to touch on? I mean, we've covered a lot of bases here. Speaking of bases, George, big baseball fan. Yeah. Did, did you play baseball growing up or just, you know, it's, just love, love watching A lot it? of people ask me that because I am such a big baseball fan. I did play baseball growing up. I played baseball in, in Little League and all the way up into high school. And I never – here's the thing. I never even tried out for baseball in high school because I literally was a really good swimmer. I went to state every year. And I knew I was a better swimmer as far as, like, being a competitor than I was at baseball. Um, I mainly pitched, but I kind of got into playing second base a little bit too. Um, but there was guys in, on the, they didn't have a, a junior team at my high school. It was just one team. And the, there was some really, really good baseball players on that team. And I really had no chance of probably playing, but I would, Mm. I knew I would do very well swimming and that's just what I did. So, um. So, yeah, I was always active. I was active in sports. Uh, my high school actually had a rim fire and an, and an archery team, even in California. But people don't realize Kern County, California is about as red as it Different. comes. It's, yeah. Not, yeah. it's not what people yeah. expect of California. It's where all the farmers are. And those people, t- those people typically are, you know, right of Attila the Hun. So... <laughs> Right on. Well, <laughs> so if you're in uh, North Kansas City, you got to be a Kansas City Royals fan. Oh yeah, for sure. And okay. uh, I'm a, the shop has season tickets, and I go to the majority of them. But I do have a couple sales guys that enjoy baseball as well. And uh, we build guns for some of the baseball players as well. Some of the actual really notable ones. I'll leave their names That's out of it cool. because I don't know what they uh, what their managers <laughs> would do to me if I mentioned yeah. names. Yeah. But well, at any rate, then, the there time. are they, a lot of baseball guys that are into shooting, and they do come 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 to the range on occasion and do some shooting. So. Yeah, and George, George has a he bought a farm outside of Kansas City and converted it into a range and it's just kind of a cool hangout place but there's low also key too. low key and but there's matches we just shot one week or two ago um so there are actually sanctioned matches that take place out there but it's just kind of a fun place and and Brian Sykes and whomever else might do some training out there for people cuz that's another service they offer so you're going hunting you just bought a rifle you can go get some world class training as well. Right. We don't do we don't do big classes like other big facilities do where we have like 20 guys come up and take a baser or advanced course. It's not our our style. Our, no. The whole idea of doing it was just for a guy who buys a high end rifle and is not um, in tune to long range shooting or even maybe uh, that type of rifle at all. Maybe it's the first time he's bought that type of thing and he wants some training and all of our trainings one-on-one every once in a while to be one on you know two like two guys and, and brian but uh, brian's put together you know a really good uh, intro to comp shooting course a really good intro to long range hunting course and then just you know some general shooting courses for the absolute novice to just get wet in the game and then decide how they how far they want to take it so um that that facility that neil describes used quite a bit and it is it's supposed to be a like a shooting farm sort of i mean there's no crops other than some hay being cut off of it but it's it's got an old barn it's got all the the different stuff you'd see at a prs match and it's got a lot of haulers and and to include an elvis statue yeah yes, don't forget yeah, that the newest uh, <laughs> the newest addition is a 
statue hand carved of Elvis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, found that yeah, this is, yeah. Yeah. There's, and there's some lions, there's some like lawn ornaments or something out there. Yeah. yeah. It's just, but they're just, you know, PRS shooting is kind of like parkour, you know, you just learn how to shoot off of random Stuff. things. Yeah. 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 Which in, in hunting, you never know what you're going to use for a rest. I mean, you're probably not going to use a Elvis. statue of Elvis, but no, <laughs> you're going to use rocks and you're going to use tr- different shaped trees. And, you know, a lot of times mm-hmm. a, depending on the state or whether it allows it a vehicle bumper hood or roll bar on a side by side. I mean, all that stuff's incorporated into PRS shooting. Um, and if you shoot PRS for any given time, it's automatically going to make you a better field shooter. There's no, yeah, that's, that's a mind. great I mean, point. Guys that I know that are not competitors, but they compete in PRS specifically just to better their, their hunting skills. Like have told me without, hundred percent like they never shot past 200 yards and now they feel comfortable shooting 450 500 on any deer size game without even blanking about it so i think i think that's huge just shooting a comp you know a series whether you are dead last or mid pack it, it's going to help you be a better shooter regardless so to all the guys that are worried about shooting their first match, they should not wait. It'll make you a better shooter. Who cares where you play? Yeah, and that's the other thing. You know, hopefully that people get. I mean, we've we've mentioned it a few times on here, but you know, you go. It can sure be intimidating. You're going to yeah. go to a PRS match, and these people have these, you know, very high quality rifles and gear and stuff like that. But I don't know what to tell a person. You can almost run what you brung, but don't be intimidated because the people that are there are going to help you. If you're a oh, new yeah. shooter. You're going to get announced that you're a new shooter. People will help you. and Oh, yeah. You don't got a rear bag. You don't have you know a game changer, which is kind of the Yeah, you know, people the will help you bags. out. Yeah, they'll borrow this one. And at the end of the day, George, I mean, you and everybody else that was there in the beginning, kudos, because the level of marksmanship in the United States of America is at an all-time high, and it just keeps getting better. Right. Mm-hmm. So that the PRS, quote-unquote, PRS style of shooting has elevated our capabilities and has been a huge driver for lots of improvements within the industry and then also in marksmanship capabilities, which is fantastic. Because like I said, I mean, we want to further the shooting sports. We have, you know, it's not just a financial interest. We we are genuinely interested in the shooting sports and want to see them succeed. Mm-hmm. And um, no, we're very thankful that things are the way they are right now and that people have, have, have taken to it. Well, like I said, it's a, they always say that whole, it takes a village thing seems blase, but at the end of the day, like all those early pioneers of shooting, you know, even the guys that were doing it, putting on these matches before me, you know, it's Galley, Bynum, uh, uh, all those guys, uh, they started it and it's just kind of perpetuated to what it is and like from what kind of gear was available like seth mentioned scopes and bullets to what's available now uh, it, it's absolutely mind-numbing and the amount of companies mm-hmm. that have evolved from it i mean there's you know over 20 some years i can probably write down a list of 100 companies that exist specifically because of that sport yeah or whether it be prs or sniper matches or nrl or F class or any of that long range precision stuff, it all, you know, caused the effect that we are seeing now. And, and it's still evolving. I mean, we're going to see stuff that, you know, that only the military plays with now come into the civilians' hands, you know, in the next five to 10 years, I bet. You know, like yep. laser range finders are 15 times now more capable than what they were when they first came out like you got one that did barely 100 yards and it didn't even do it all the time and now you have ones that'll do a mile every time you press the button without without question and there's expensive ones that'll do five or ten kilometers without questioning and they're just you know not affordable but that stuff didn't even exist when this started not even in the slightest yeah it's been a fun fun ride yeah it really yeah it is it's yeah, and like I had mentioned earlier, we're all enthusiasts. Uh, you know, I mentioned that about you and, and wildcatting and tinkering with stuff. And yeah. I think everybody I know in this industry, for the most part, is yeah, is is in having fun riding this train because man, it's crazy to see the evolution and how fast that evolution has happened, and then continuing to increase at the rate in which it's happening. Which is I don't great. remember the exact quote, but it's it's written on a refrigerator. At Rifles Only, 
about long range shooting being the most interesting form of shooting. It's why it's it's very popular because it interests people. It ha- you have to think. Uh, mm-hmm. There's math involved. There's it's more than just pulling a trigger and putting a sight on a piece of steel at 20 feet, like you know some of the pistol sports and, and some of the carving sports. Like there's a lot of challenge and thinking involved. So uh, I think that's what makes people interested and stick with it because you're always learning, always. I mean, I've been in it for a long time, and I learn stuff every time I go to a match. At least I, I hope I do anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's the goal. Well, guys, I, I appreciate you guys uh, sharing your insight. I know it's been a, almost an hour and a half here, so it's probably time to, to wrap this one up. But, George, we'll definitely have you on some more podcasts as we talk about more specific products because uh, your insight you know, with the PRS and the rifle building and then just precision shooting as a whole is is incredibly valuable yeah would love to come back anytime it's fun to talk to you guys it's fun to to kind of remember some of the history and i'm sure i missed bits and pieces as well so for those of of you that know have been around as long as me if i miss some stuff sorry my head my head is not (laughs) hundred percent what you say. You're yeah, leaving but, for Alaska tomorrow. Yeah, we get but it. history happens every day. Yeah. You just don't know yeah. it. You know, yeah. I mean, there's, there's major moments that happen and that, you know, it's just, it's a Tuesday. So yeah. Yeah. Well, have fun in Alaska, man. We'll see you after, uh, we'll see you at the PRS match coming up. 